<clears throat> okay, so um, those of you who haven't done Go Tour, it, it's really important that you do it. Uh, otherwise, you will be kind of uh, catching up with things, and Go Tour is really easy to explain uh, some of the fundamentals. So, um, question, which was not directly in the Go Tour, but nevertheless. So who, who doesn't know what is a lambda function? Everybody knows, that's good. Perfect. So <clears throat> some, so if we go to, Uh, so some uh, languages have a special syntax for uh, lambda functions. In Go, you define functions by saying f and then saying parameters and then what it returns. So we can say uh, we have a function which takes two integers and returns an integer, and that's a named function. It has a name a f, and then if we just delete the name, then we have a lambda function. So we can assign it to something. We can say f is actually a function which does this, right? And then we can write the body, body of the of the function. So indeed, lambda functions are simply written as func without the name. Cool. Next. So type inheritance, how we de deal with type inheritance. We were partially dealing with it uh, in the last session. So those who, who paid attention last, last time know. So if we go to course, yeah. Remember we were doing this sort of a hello world example and we were, um, oops, that's not the one. we were writing this kind of uh, inheritance-like uh, thing, which um, simulated that circle extended a point. Uh, and we've done it by composition. So we included the point inside the uh, second struct, struct, but we couldn't say cycle inherits from point. We have to kind of do it through composition. So that's good. All right, what's next? So go inheritance. Um, as I explained last, last time, uh, there is a tendency for modern languages to kind of uh, give up uh, very long uh, inheritance chains or, or give up inheritance at all and use composition instead. And by doing that, we kind of uh, delegating some of the uh, functionality to a subtype. So we have uh, a, an ability to do that uh, with, with composition. And then we have interfaces. So we, uh, last time we didn't, um, we didn't talk much about interfaces. We use the interface for some ge geometric shapes to see how can we abstract some property. Um, and we use the area property such that we could calculate area on different types and have kind of a polymorphic um, shape type, which could be a circle or a, a rectangle, and then calculate the area of that using the interface. And then we have, so that, that's what we've done last time. Uh, there is this concept of interface um, open close bracket, uh, and that is like a type 
So let, let me go to go tour. I will type some code. So if we have, um, yeah, we do have a data here. So if I have, uh, if I say my type is D and it's the interface of that, of that form, it is kind of those of you who know Java, it's kind of like an object of type object, right? It's a kind of a base class, which everything fits in. So any struct would be fine or any type would be fine with that, with that interface. So if I have a function, if I have a function F, which takes uh, some argument A and, it, uh, and it's an interface like this, that means that function can take any argument uh, because we don't care what type that is, right? So now kind of a question to you, like from what you already know in Go and you don't know a lot, uh, but from what you already know, where do you use this? Where do you see it used in this code snippet? Where, where do we use this kind of construct of a type that can be anything? Any, any ideas? We already using it. I can give you a hint. We already using it in that snippet. <laughs> All right, so, so print line. Print line function takes any type of argument because it can print numbers, it can print strings, it can print anything, right? So it can take L, it can take a string, it can take D. So it's kind of a polymorphic, right? So print line and print take, you know, argument of that form such that it can be anything. So that's a useful construction when you want to have this kind of a dynamic um, uh, property. So this is for uh, interface with the open and square brackets. So let's also, let's have a, a short, um, short, um, recall on what we did with the shape and how we deal with interfaces. So for example, if I say um, I have a shape interface and this interface has a method called area and the area returns a float 64, for example, right? So I have um, um, a shape interface which provides me an access to something that has this function uh, built in. Uh, and then if I have my struct, so let's yeah, have a sim sim simple um, type. Let's say type that's tangle is a struct and it has um, width and height. And those are float 64. Uh, fields. So now um, I need to define a method which is called area on top of that of that struct. So the def definition of method is using the reference to rec and then area and then float 64. And then I, we will kind of uh, return, we will, now we need to access the fields of that rectangle, right? So in Java or in uh, C++, what would happen is we have a method on top of an object and to get the reference to the, to the attributes of that object, we would use a construct called this, right? We would say this uh, dot, and then we would refer to the attributes. Um, and here we already have a reference because we are defining it here. So, and here there is no concept of this. You just say R times uh, R height, right? Uh, so by doing this here, we have the, the kind of a reference point to what is the struct that we doing this method on. And you have two choices. One choice is to do the uh, method on top of the value. The other option is you can do the um, um, the method on top of the reference to a value, right? So what would be the difference if I defined it like this or like this? 
in this particular case? Should you use this or should you use this? Does it make a difference in this? Yeah. In this particular case, does it make a difference? So which one would you use? You would use this or this? All right, so let, let's make a, a little bit more complicated example here. Uh, let's have another method. Um, so we'll have another function on top of R, which is called set H. And we'll put H and we'll say float 64. And this method doesn't return anything. So we will have no return parameter. A return value and then we'll say r dot h equals h right so should i do should i have it like this or like this what would be the difference yep okay can you say louder yep Yes, so if I put an asterisk here, that means this method operates on the reference or pointer to R, to the struct. If I don't do this asterisk, then I'm operating on the value of the struct itself, right? So what would be the, what would be the difference? All right, so let's continue this chain of thought. Let me delete that. Yep. Yeah, does it, does it change the, the variable? Does it modify the variable when you have the stuff? Exactly. That's exactly what the difference is. So if I have, um, I have my uh, red stangle R here, and I say that I, did, yeah, rec. So I defined rec, right? And now if I say area is, rec area right it will be zero because this one um, initiated the struct for me with zero values right so it'll be zero times zero it's zero so it's fine but that would work right but if i set rec set set h and i set 1.0 um so let's have two parameters, H and W, R dot W equals W, say HW, and I set set. Okay, so what is A now? Would A be zero or A would be one? With this implementation. I think you're missing a W in there. Uh, set W, yes. So there is a one bug. I am missing function body for this because we didn't do anything here. Okay. All right. So here is our answer. It's zero, right? So we set uh, H and R, uh, A, 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 H uh, and W to one and one. But it not nothing happened. Why? Why nothing happened? Okay, so let's put star. And let's rerun it. Whoa, uh, the answer is one. It worked. What well, it worked as we expected, but it kind of works in the first case as well. Because what happens? Uh, what happens in this line 28 uh, here is that rec gets copied. So the value which rec has is copied to a different value, which is exactly the same, but it's a, a new value. And we execute this method on this new value, set one and one to h and w, and this, this new value disappears. So, because we don't use it anywhere else. So if we don't put the pointer, uh, we're making a copy of the struct, passing it to a method, 
and then returning, right? So when we calculate the area, uh, when I'm doing this call, exactly the same thing happens. There is a copy of rec, which is created here, passed to this method. This method reads those two values out of this new rec, calculates the area and gives me the result, right? And then the value disappears. And because we don't manipulate the value, the, the, uh, the struct, that's okay, right? So this method, which doesn't changes the state of rec, is okay to operate on the copy, right? But this method, which we intend to change the state of the rec, needs to operate on the original rec, not on the copy. So we need to have a reference or a pointer to it, right? So we, you, we have to use this asterisk because then this call doesn't make a copy. This call actually, um, the references, the original rec calls the method on it and then gives me a value. So this call at 28 is actually a syntactic sugar for this. If rec was, um, if we expecting rec to be a pointer, uh, but it, it is not, rec is a, a kind of a value. So it's a syntactic sugar for this, right? In, in which case it, it's like, um, it, it, it turns rec into a pointer and passes it to a method which expects a pointer because um, rec is not a pointer. Rec would be a pointer if I did this, right? Now rec is, in, uh, is a pointer, but now it isn't. Now it's a value. So we have kind of a weird, weird, weird situation here where I'm calling this method on a pointer and this method on a value, and it looks exactly the same, right? You cannot do that in C++. You always either use dot when you're calling on a value or this kind of um, this symbol when you're calling on a pointer, right? But here in Golang, Golang has kind of a syntactic sugar for you. And it kind of says, yeah, yeah, I, I know what you mean. You mean kind of, I need to turn it into a pointer, right? So in fact, it's kind of does it, does this for you uh, and then calls the method which expects the pointer. Does it make sense? So it kind of looks, because of that, it looks kind of cleaner, uh, but it hides a little bit of this complexity of turning uh, this into this. So look, it, it kind of works, right? It prints me one, but what if I change it to a pointer now? Will it work? Will area be happy with a pointer instead of the value? Well, it will be because of the same reason, right? So now this one says, yeah, yeah, yeah. I know rec is a pointer and I need a copy. I need a value. So what I will do is I will dereference your rec and do this, right? So that happens kind of automatically. Yep. So uh, is there any idiomatic pattern that they, uh, or uh, put it this way, the optimizations in the compiler deal with most of the either use case, right? So there's, or would you recommend from a coding perspective yeah. that there's an idiomatic pattern that you should follow? That, that's, a good, that's a good question. So uh, the normal idiomatic way is to always have methods which use pointers. Uh, and always do something like this instead of doing the value, unless you really want the value. Uh, the reason is you're preventing multiple copies of things, right? So if you create pointers and refer to pointers and make pointers, then every time you're making a call, the copy doesn't have to be made, right? If I, if I don't have this, up, um, this kind of a symbol here, that means this is like a value type and I have a value here, and every time I'm doing something, uh, especially on a value, especially if I'm not using a pointer, the system needs to make a copy, right? Because it cannot manipulate the value of the original. So it creates multiple copies. In our case, I mean, this is a very trivial struct with only two fields, but imagine you have like, you know, a 64K array in here, then making multiple copies for every method call for calculating the area would be an overkill, right? You don't want that. So usually the kind of idiomatic way is use pointers for your interfaces, make them operate on the pointer types, and then use pointers in your code. And then if you really need a value, 
you can always dereference it. You can always say, I want the value of rec. Most of the time, Go will know you want the value and will do it for you. And you don't even need to say asterisk uh, rec. Uh, and so that's kind of a rule of thumb. Another rule of thumb, which you can violate, which we violated originally was um, if you have a struct like rec and you have some methods which operate on pointers and some methods which operate on value. That is kind of considered, uh, you can do it, like it, it will compile and it will run, but that's considered kind of non-idiomatic. You should not do that. You should either consistently have everything using pointers or everything using value if that makes sense, right? For example, if you have an interface, like empty interface, which is kind of really easy to make copies of because it's effectively nil, uh, then you can have everything on value types, right? Uh, but as I said, you, usually you will see people doing that. So defining methods on a particular class, you could call it. Uh, it's not really a class, it's a struct, but you know, it's a struct with methods. So it really looks like a C++ or Java class. Um, so that's the kind of idiomatic way of doing it. Does it make sense? Any questions about this? Um, yep, so I guess that should kind of be relatively clean. So let's uh, look a little bit more into Golang things. So those of you who didn't do the Go tour may struggle. So declare and initiate B to be a slice of ints, one, two, three, four, and do it in one line. Yeah, we uh, we actually did it in the Proc two hundred six. Uh, yeah, as a side as a side thing, comparing like a, um, so it's a little bit cheating. Right, perfect. So I can see. I don't know why this wasn't a correct answer. Um. Yeah, I mean, the correct answer is wrong. Yeah, the correct answer is wrong because it's missing four. It should supposed to be one, two, three, four. So this is a correct answer. Yeah. Uh, yeah, yeah, that, that's a completely wrong answer. So uh, whoever wrote the correct answer here is completely got it wrong. <laughs> Could be me. <laughs> <laughs> All right, so if we go to our rectangles and our uh, fancy things, if we say we have B, and then we say B is a slice of ints, and then we initiate it, one, two, three, four, then we have the solution. Um, is it idiomatic to do it this way, or is it more idiomatic to say there is a variable b which is of type int and do it like this? Well, it's actually more idiomatic in Go to do this. It's much more idiomatic to do this. So if you can do this, you should use this. Sometimes you cannot do this because you don't know what the value is. It kind of, for example, you're calculating it by a user input or something, and you need to declare it earlier then you probably need to have kind of a, in a global scope, a declaration. But if you can avoid this, uh, idiomatic ways to avoid it and, and do this instead, right? Uh, why, why is that? What do you think? Why people gravitated towards this rather than the other one? Well, it's like two lines of code versus one. Okay, that's already a winning point. The second point is, you may decide to change it to floats, right? Or to kind of change something like uh, make it in 64, for example. And then it's only one change. If you have it in two places, you have to do that change twice, right? So that's maintenance wise is also better. So that's why this kind of a single liner is uh, a better option. All right, so that's easy. So what, what's next? 
what awaits us. Okay, we have a little bit more complex. Again, those who did the tour should have no problems with this one. So maps in Python, those are called dictionary. In Java, that was called a map, hash map uh, or a map interface. Uh, in C++, it's called map. Um, it's like a data structure which has key value pairs and the keys are of certain type and then the values are of certain type. And here we want keys to be strings and values to be ints. So how we do that? Let's see if the correct answer is correct. <laughs> All right. The correct answer is correct, right? So do we have correct answers? Almost here, it's the missing the kind of a string for the keys. Um, some almost, yeah, this one is good. This one is good. Yeah, so it's all, almost like uh, it's missing this uh, type data thingy, right? So when we define a type, like it says define a type data, right? So if you were to be strictly following the spec, you have to say, okay, I need a type. So yeah, I have the answer here. I need a type uh, data, which is a map of strings to ints, okay? Um, Golang is quite nice because even if you don't exactly remember the syntax, you can kind of almost always work out the syntax because you know it, it has to follow like from left to right and it, it has to be kind of like logically aligned. So type comes first, so type, and then the name and then what it is. So if I need a struct, I have to say type data struct and then my fields. If I need a map, I say type, data, map, and then the types. And because it's a key value, then you kind of need to remember that it's like in the square brackets. Uh, and then there is key value. All right, next one. I, I think I can mark some of the wrong answers to be correct actually through the interface. Yeah. 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 All right, so now once we have a type, we can declare a variable D to be of that type and we want to initiate it. It doesn't say what you are supposed to initiate it with, which means kind of pretty much with nothing, right? But it needs to be initiated. Can you have something in Go language is not initiated? Can you have something that has been not initiated that it will throw a kind of um, exception that it's uh, not initiated? Uh, no. No. So by default, Golang kind of prevents kind of a null pointer exception by saying you cannot have a null things. Like everything that is nil is, has been somewhat initiated. It will be empty, but it's already initiated, right? Can you have a panic? Can you have like a null pointer exception in Golan apart from uh, the previous question? All right, so let's do that first. So we have some good, good answers. So we have, uh, this one is a good answer. This one is also a good answer. Um, This one is a good answer. Can I, let's see, mark correct. Yes, I can. Um, but I need to find them. So it shows me all the, yeah, like this one. So it is a bit tedious. Yeah, anyway, I marked the, the one which I found, the one which I said was correct. Yeah, this one. 
All right, so what, what's the difference uh, between, oh yeah, this one, this one is bug, bugged. So it's almost correct. It's like case, case is important in Golang, uh, of course. So to initiate D, we would say D is data. And then we could say, yeah, initiate it. Or we could say make. What's the more, more idiomatic way? Is it to use make or is it to use uh, the curly braces? Right, so the more idiomatic way is actually to do make if you're initiating something without uh, the, um, actually putting anything in it, right? So there is a difference between this and doing D equals um, data, and then we say uh, some key and some value, right? So 10. If we if we actually initiating it, then we use curly braces because we're kind of putting some initial values in. But if we're not doing it, then make is better. Um, so probably the compiler can work it out. Like if you have an em empty curly braces, it will know that it's exactly the same as this one. Um, but this this kind of does two things. It first allocates the memory for the data and then sets the initial values, right? So it's, it is kind of doing two things. Whereas this one does only one thing, which is allocating value, uh, allocating memory for the type that we need, right? So like semantically, it's a little bit different and the more idiomatic ways to do this. Um, they will effectively be the same, like the, the, uh, semantically they are kind of doing, um, achieving the same result. Okay, uh, make, what else can you make in Golang? What, what can I call make with? What can be inside? Can I say, uh, can I say make me a rec? Can I do that? Let's try it. Uh, so we have a bunch of things that we are declaring but not using. Okay, so here is your answer, <laughs> right? So it says, I cannot make rec for you, sorry. I can only make slices, maps, or channels, right? So it can make maps, slices, or channels, but it cannot make arbitrary red stangles. So for red stangle, we are kind of at that syntax, right? Okay, next. So, how do I close this? All right, next one. So now we want to extract the value of Tom. So we have a map. Uh, one of the keys we know is Tom. We want to extract that, that key. How do we do that? Again, a trivial, trivial question to those who did the tour. It's kind of hard to make this one wrong. Um, a lot of good answers. Although, uh, yeah, you can you can mess it up as well. So th this is correct, of course. Um, and then there are some like small mistakes related to how you get it. Um, so this one is almost correct. It 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 
misses the format dot print line. Um, okay, so let me just quickly do this. So now we initiated data. So we say D uh, of Tom is 10. And then we want to print format print line. Uh, what was that? D of Tom. What is nice is that the syntax for accessing and setting is the same. Uh, so the, the setting is like this, accessing is like this, right? So that, that will work. We got the number 10. Um, what if there is no Tom? So what if I have uh, Thomas instead and I ask for Tom, what I'm gonna get? What will I get if I ask a map for something that the map doesn't have? Ideas? What did, what if I, let's say I have a map in C++ and the map doesn't have something and I'm kind of trying to get it, then what I will get back? Oh, come on. Huh? Nothing? Good. I will get nothing. So what, what is nothing in C++? Null, right? I would get null. Uh, what I will get in Python? I will get nil, right? What I'm going to get here? Right. So the problem is um, we declared that it's a map of strings to ints. What is an int? Can int be nil or null? No, it cannot. It's a value type. It's not a pointer type, right? So there is no integer called nil. Like it doesn't make sense. So I cannot get nil, right? So if I ask for something the map doesn't have, it cannot give me nil because it violates this contract. It, it, the contract is the map only has numbers, right? So what I'm gonna get? What I'm gonna get to represent me an empty object? What do you think? There are kind of two logical choices. Zero. Right, zero or minus one, right? Th those are kind of a two logical choices for saying there is nothing, right? Minus one in this case actually means something, right? So zero is the choice. So if I run this, I'm gonna get zero, right? So it says, yeah, Thomas is zero. Like Tom, Tom is zero, right? Uh, but Tom doesn't exist in my map. Like Tom actually is not there. So how I'm gonna distinguish Tom, uh, who is not there, from Thomas, who is there and has value zero, right? Okay, then we have a additional syntax. So I have additional syntax, which tells me if something is in there, right? So the syntax is like this. I can have a value and I have okay, and I can ask, give me uh, Tom, right? And I have value, uh, value, Tom and I have value Tom uh, Thomas and okay and D give me Thomas right so in both cases in both of, both of those two cases I'm gonna get zero as a value both for Tom and for Thomas right so in both cases it's zero this value is zero but in the case of Tom I'm gonna get false. And in case of Thomas, I'm gonna get true for the second parameter, right? So then I can know if the value was there, but the value is actually zero, or if the value was not there at all and it gave me zero, right? So if you need to know, if you care if Thomas and Tom differ because Thomas is already there and Tom is not, then you can do this. You can do this syntax to check which one is in and which one isn't. Uh, and if you don't care, then you can do this and you're gonna get zero regardless whether Tom is in there or not, right? Okay, so that's a map. Um, 
that's ma map demystified. Yep. Break. All right. So let's do one more, and then we'll have a break. I hear you. I hear you. <laughs> All right. One more. Okay, so the, the, the one more which we are doing is actually, our, we already done it. So the next one is um, check if map has Tom and if it does print, okay. So, so we kind of did it, but we did it in a kind of a, partial way. How are you going to write an if statement which does that? So kind of uh, write an if statement which does that task. So it checks if Tom is there, and, then, and if it is, print, print line OK. Yeah, break after this. All right, so I guess nobody really did it. Um, so it has kind of a, some interesting Golang uh, syntaxes for, for doing this. Um, so the, your typical if statement in Golang is, um, you know, um, if, okay, and then you do something, right? This is your typical, um, and here is kind of an expression which evaluates to a Boolean value. If it's true, then do something. If it's not true, don't do it, right? Uh, but Golang has additional syntax. And this additional syntax allows you to do this, uh, to put this line in here and say, then if okay, do something. And because we don't care about the actual value, we only checking if Tom is there. We don't care what value uh, Tom maps to. We can say, I don't care about that value. And then you, when, whenever you, you don't care about the particular variable and, but you need a place holder for it. Same here, if we didn't care about the value, we could put a place holder, which is an underscore. So you do that same here. So you say, I don't care about the first value. I only care about the second one. Tell me if Tom is there. And then if Tom is there, then okay will be true. And then if statement will evaluate to true and then the body will, will work. So format, uh, print line, uh, print line would work, right? We were asked to print, okay. If we were to ask, if we were asked to print the value of that, then we would print uh, V and we will ask for V here. Is it idiomatic to do this this way? Yes, it's idiomatic to do it this way, why? Why it's better to do it this way rather than doing it this way and then asking if okay only. So we have two options. We either do it with those two lines, uh, number 36 and 38, or uh, as a single line, which is 41. Why this one is more idiomatic? Why this one is better? Yeah? Exactly, that's a very good point. So we want the scope, like, okay, lives now in the global scope of our method, right? We polluted all our method scope with the values which we only use inside the if statement and nowhere else. Therefore, why should you pollute it? You should contain the values and uh, variables that you use only to the scope that you need them and don't pollute. That's why we don't use global variables for everything because that's bad practice. It's the same inside the body of the methods. You want to constrain the scope of what you need to be declared only to the places where you're using it. Uh, so this pollutes our scope with V and OK. This one doesn't. And that's why this one is preferred. And that's why you should use this uh, if you can. All right, so let's have a break. Um, Two minutes. <laughs> no.
Five minutes? 10 minutes? All right. Let's go for 10 minutes. <laughs> Uh, so th there is a comment in the chat about this uh, if statement, this notation for if statement, and uh, Jon Gunnar is uh, mentioning that it's uh, useful uh, for this nil Boolean pattern, uh, and then you have um, uh, less of a chance of an old variable possibly affecting your code, right? Uh, because you kind of maintain the scope only to the places that you need to. So that's that's a good comment. Thanks, uh, Jon Gunnar. Um, there is also a question about generics. Uh, so generics is a relatively new uh, Golang um, feature and Golang does have generics and you can um, generate uh, functions which have a, a generic um, uh, type. So for example, if we were to have some, yeah, let's, let's show some example. Let's say we have, um, um let's let's have a function which inserts a new element into a, a, a slice okay and we want this function to be generic such we that we don't care what slice type we're dealing with so what we would do is we would have to say that we have a func which let's say uh, it's called insert uh, and then because we're not defining types directly we would use square brackets so say there is a type T and then, you know, we, we can specify some constraints. Um, so for, for now, let, let me say it's any, and then we will say, so that there is a func, func ins, which um, takes a slice of type T and an element of t right so i have an element i which is i and i have some sort of collection which is of that right and i will uh return a new slice of t right so that will be that would be my syntax for um specifying my function which is a generic function and then t it's kind of like templating in c plus plus a little bit um so then t is where you would normally have type so if I didn't have this and I said, you know, int um, and int and int, that, that would be kind of the same. But if you want to gen make it generic, you're kind of doing it with this square brackets here. And then you can use T. Um, so now, um, can I really write the code here about this? And the thing is I would have to use I would have to, um, because I want to insert at this particular location, the new I of type T, uh, then I have to compare it, right? So if I'm kind of inserting it always at the end, like append, then any would do. But if I need to compare it, then I have to use a different kind of um, a constraint and I would say comparable. Um, so that means I can kind of uh, compare two items of type T between each other. So I can use the, uh, less than or bigger than sign and kind of write the logic, right? So then I would kind of write the logic here the, the way I want and use C and I as if they have a type, uh, but they are not with, with any type. And then when you actually calling a function, you have to specify, like if I'm calling ins, um, oops, oops. So then if I'm calling ins um, and uh, ins can infer what type what type t i mean it will kind of work otherwise you have to coerce it again by square brackets right so you can kind of coerce it here by square brackets saying i mean the instantiation for int t was int right uh, or if if it can work out automatically which it can 99% of the time you just call it with let's say some sort of a int and um slice and then it would do it so Generics are not super complicated, but most of the time you don't really need need them um, unless you need them. Like wh when you do have a case where generic code is kind of useful, then there is no workaround. Any other solution is, really sucks, right? Because you have to repeat your code. Like Christopher had to copy and paste 
a lot of his methods because he was writing his system when Golang didn't have generics. <laughs> so he has a lot of repeated code because you have to, you know, parameterize your functions for a particular type that you want the logic to work. Uh, and if you want your logic to work for, let's say, three or four types, then you have to kind of copy and paste it, right? Um, if with generics, you can solve it in kind of a very uh, generic way, uh, but it's in, in this course, you probably will not encounter the need for that, hopefully. Uh, but if you do, then you can look it up. It's it's not super complicated and, and it works. So that's the um, Golang generics question. People were kind of bugging Golang developers about generics from the very beginning. From the version 1.0, people were saying, okay, the language sucks because it doesn't have generics, right? Um, Yes, it's true, the language sucks because it doesn't have generics, but for most of the time, you don't really need generics. Uh, but yes, when you do have a use case where you need them, then they are there. Um, okay, so those were the two points from the text comments. Um, let's continue. Let's see what's next. All right, so let's see how you guys are doing. Uh, some of you are doing pretty well, some of you are doing less well, and then you know which questions you could answer and which questions you couldn't. Uh, you will definitely use everything that I was talking about in your code, in your programming. Uh, those are kind of very uh, fundamental, simple things that you will be um, using. Okay, so Go is not lazy. Um, what it means you cannot represent infinite data structures with Golang, which is the same as in C++, which is the same in um, uh, original Java. And then they've added kind of uh, lazy collections where you could have kind of uh, infinite uh, collections, right? Um, and in Rust, we also have kind of uh, infinite collections and same in Haskell, but in Golang, you don't. So in Golang, you have to do things with loops. And if you need to represent kind of an infinite data structure, we'll do it with the infinite loop. So how you do infinite loop in, in Golang? So this is one of the features which I really like about Go uh, and I hate about Rust. <laughs> so, yeah, uh, let's wait 20 seconds. <laughs> Perfect. I can see some correct answers already. So I don't know why why I didn't count it as a correct answer. So the case is wrong. That should be lowercase. Um, yeah, for true, sort of, not really. Uh, and there was, yeah, this one. This one is a correct answer. I don't know why it says it isn't. Um, So let me try, marked correct. Uh, this one is a correct answer, yes. All right, so now it is a correct answer. Um, Golang has only one construct for loops, which is called for. So you only need to learn one keyword, which is like three letters, okay? In Rust, you have like four four different keywords for doing what Go does with one keyword. Why? I have no idea, right? You could just do everything with just one language keyword, which does it for you, right? So Golang has kind of a, a, a four, which you can use as a four condition, which is kind of like while. Uh, you can use it for four X equals, you know, one, uh, X less than 10 and X plus plus, sorry, X plus plus, right? So that's like a normal for loop in, um, in uh, C++ or other languages. And then you can degenerate it. So you can say, I don't need that part. 
or you can say I don't need that part and in which case you don't need even those those things or you can say I don't need any of those and then you have infinite loop right so it's a very nice very um, clever way of using a language keyword so when you're learning a language it's only one thing you need to learn I mean one keyword and then when you're learning Rust you need to learn four keywords which is like four times more uh, and there is no reason for that Okay, so that's about um, people loving loops. Uh, so when you're programming in Golang, you will have to love slices. You will kind of need to get used to maps uh, because those are the fundamental uh, data structures which you use. Of course, structs are like classes everywhere else. So that's kind of same as C++ or Java, but you will be doing a lot of things with loops. Uh, if you're coming from C++ or Java, then it will be not such a pain point for you. But if you're coming from Haskell or Python even, you will feel like, why? Why do I need to use loops for everything? So let's do some exercises. So let's compare uh, life with and without ranges. So ranges is a kind of a construct in some programming languages, which Python has, uh, but Golang doesn't. So here is a question from Stack Overflow. I kind of uh, found it yesterday, uh, which says, Go range can iterate over maps and slices, but I was wondering if there is a way to iterate over a range of numbers, something like this. Like, you know, because there is a range keyword. Um, so if I have my, let's go back to our example. Uh, we have, Okay, let's make let's make data to be a slice of ints, uh, and then let's say we have. Um, I need to delete that. Yeah, we don't need those shapes anymore. We are familiar with uh, pointers and all that nice things, so we only need to remember that. Okay, so. Okay, one question: Should we? Should we say B is a slice of ints and it's one, two, three, four? Or should we say there is a data type, which is a slice of ints, and B is that type? So should we do this? One, two, three, and four. Which one is better? Yeah, that's right and also data communicates a little bit to you what we're dealing with and what it is for and like where you're supposed to use it and where you're not supposed to use it right if you end up having for example two different slices of ints one representing grades and one representing age of students right and one method takes grades and the other method takes age of students and they are all slice of ins or slice of floats then you can by mistake pass something somewhere else right so it's kind of nicer if you kind of define your type and then you know if something kind of doesn't add up like something was misused right so th there is a little bit of extra boilerplate but this boilerplate communicates intent and it, it usually is better to do this with this rather than this. Of course, now we have two lines of code instead of one. So sometimes we opt for this if it is not such a big deal, right? In this particular case, it's definitely not such a big deal because I'm not kind of doing anything much here. Uh, so we can stick to, the, to, the, to that simple version, but in your programs, usually the other option is better. And in Golang, it's kind of cheap to define those types. Uh, anyway, so we have a for loop and I can say, for x, which is in a range of b, print print me something, right? Um, format print line x. So this range keyword has again a kind of a dual um, 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 syntax. It has kind of like a key value syntax. So it is um, uh, a value and the index, right? Uh, I never remember like for a range, which is a slice, which one is the index and which one is the value. Uh, so let's try this uh, and let's try to mess it up with going from like this. So let's 
try to run it. D, where is D? Ah, oh, yeah, here. All right, because we don't dealing with Tom anymore. Okay. So you see the first one is the index, right? Uh, it's not the value. So it's a key value. And the first one is the index. We don't care about the index. So we, we will say this and we care about the X. So we'll rewrite it and rerun it. Uh, so now we have two, 32, three, four, right? So that works. Um, so the, the range kind of, uh, it's sort of like an iterator in Java or in um, uh, C++ where you kind of can iterate over a range of something and you don't need to specify like uh, additional variable to keep uh, count of, of what we're doing, right? So it's a kind of a, a very idiomatic way of doing loops over collections in, in Golang. So now the question is, um, where was the question? The question was, could I do range from one to 10, right? I want to inline to do a loop from one to 10 using a range. Uh, and the answer is, you know, 342 upvotes. Yeah, and nah, we don't have that. We just do a loop, right? It's a, a very old fashioned, very nasty, very, you know, problematic loop with additional I to do this one liner, which would be able to do with ranges, right? You cannot do that in Golang. Like, I don't know why they don't have ranges, but that would be like, I would prefer to have this feature rather than generics. And I would prioritize that over generics having ranges, um, but no, nay. So you just have to live with loops. So you just have to write, you know, loops. So now if you were to initiate a slice of ints from one to thousand, um, in a single line, you can't really do that. You have to use a multi-line code, which um, iterates over a for loop and does it, right? So can you write it? Like um, the one liner would be much simpler. The Even with the loop, it would be much simpler. Uh, but this is like an old fashioned loop with ints, like, and you have to have uh, additional variable. All right, so I will, um, is anyone trying to write it? Yeah, exactly, that would be nice. Um, yeah, almost, you kind of need to do a little bit more magic inside. So the loop is okay. It goes from um, from one to thousand exclusive, uh, but the, the inside you need to be appending uh, new values to your, slice, right? And the appending to the slice doesn't work like this. That syntax works with array, arrays, but not with slices. Uh, you can read stuff and you can uh, replace what is already there, but to grow the slice, you cannot use this syntax. Uh, you have to use a, a method append. Okay, so let me see if I have the solution for this. Yeah, uh, no, I don't. I, I say, yeah, that would be really nice if you could do this, but you cannot do this. Uh, let's move through that. That would be really nice if you could do that as well, but you cannot do that neither. Um, so I haven't written up it up, so I have to write it for you. So let's say we want to have a C or small C and it must be a slice from one to thousand, okay? So we have to have a for loop and we have to say from X or I uh, equals, sorry, um, I less than thousand, I plus plus. So now I have to like initiate C, what C is. So I, can say, remember, we can say, make me a slice, right? So we can say, make me a slice of ints. Um, and then when you're asking for a slice, you can ask for um, two things. You can ask for pre-allocating the size of the slice. So I can say, uh, initially it, 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 it size is zero. And then the, if the size is zero, 
then the current kind of uh, what this, uh, the slice contains cannot be bigger than zero. So it, the second parameter is also zero or you skip it. Um, if you try to skip the parameters at all, um, like, let's see. I may get into trouble with unused things. Yeah, so uh, no, I didn't. It says, um, if I'm making a slice, it expects two or three arguments and you cannot initiate it just with one. So you have to say how big it initially is. What I could do is I could say it's thousand bytes big. And then, but the initial slice is like, um, the length of the slice will be zero. But when I'm growing it, it will be not reallocating memory. It will be kind of just changing the references of where I am in the underlying array uh, to hold the content, right? So a slice is like a view over an underlying array. Uh, and if I didn't say thousand, if I said zero, the underlying array is zero. So the first time I want to append something to a slice, it would look and say, oh, whoops, the, the underlying array is too small because it's like zero. So I have to grow it. Uh, and then I can put the first item in, right? And Golang has some clever algorithms of how big the underlying array should be, but it always kind of uh, starts with something. And then once you reach the limit, it kind of doubles what you have. So let's say in our case, we started with zero. It kind of appended like it allocated maybe, I don't know, 10 items. And then once we reach 10, it will double it to 20 and then it will double it to 40 and so on. And at some point I need a thousand, but it may end up having like allocating 2000 because I just hit the boundary on nine, nine, 999. And you're not in control of that, right? So if you know your data structure is gonna hold thousand numbers, a uh, thousand ints, you should tell it, you should say, please pre-allocate thousand ints for me. And then it will not be doing those allocations and deallocations of memory for you, right? So if you know we're gonna initiate a C, which is thousand, you say thousand. And then you say, what is the initial, um, uh, like where is the, like the initial end of, of the slice? Do we kind of look at the beginning and we stop at the beginning? Or do we look from the beginning to somewhere? Like where, where is the end? Um, so if you if I don't specify, it means it's zero. And then if I didn't specify and it means it's zero and I want to give me the first element, which is the element index zero, then it will throw because it says, you know, you are kind of empty and you cannot ask for the first element because we are, you know, we don't have any elements, right? Uh, if I tell it we are at the thousand or 999, it will say, yep, I can give you. And what it will give me? zero because zero represents an empty element, right? So here I have an option, like if you need C, which is initiated for thousand, it's a slice of thousand zeros, you can say, yeah, uh, we have a thousand zeros, right? So I want the initial size to be thousand and that global size to be thousand and then you're done. All your items are zero, but we don't want that. We want one, two, three, four, five and so on, right? Uh, in which case, uh, we can say we are starting with zero because we don't want everything to be pre-allocated to zero. Um, why? Well, when I ask it in line 10 to give me an array of thousand ints, it has to look in memory and say, I need to find an unused memory, which has thousand ints, which we can use for that array, right? What is the chance that this unused uh, RAM has all zeros? very, very small. Like there will be some empty memory that I can use, but it has been used before. So it will not be just zeros, right? So if I said, I don't care about where my pointer is, I'm, I'm kind of starting from scratch, then it just gives me that memory and doesn't do anything else because it knows I have to initiate the memory myself now, right? But if I told it, I want thousand uh, items, then it knows, oh shit, I have to zero everything, right? So it allocates the memory and goes and makes it all zeros, right? Uh, because it has to do it because the int null value is zero. So it's cheaper if I don't tell it to do this because I don't care. I will initiate it myself in the loop. And then in the loop, you have to do something like this. You have to say, C is my slice and C is append C and then you append 
like consecutive numbers, right? So we append one, two, three, four, five, and then the slice will be growing because append appends this item at the end of the slice. And initially the slice was empty. So the first one will be one and blah, 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 right? You get the idea? Okay, and that's how you have to do it. So you will do this line to pre-allocate a slice to contain, to be able to store thousand elements. And then you will run a loop and you will kind of initiate it, right? Um, any questions about that? So there is a there are two types in Golang. There is an array type, which is a fixed length array, and you can resize it. It's like an um, uh, it's like an array in C or C plus plus, right? The array type with the square brackets, and then there is a kind of a um, expandable array like data structure, which in Golang is called slice, which in C plus plus is called vector or vec. And it, it kind of is the same thing, right? Um, so you can append things to a vector, same here, you can append things to a slice, but in Golang, slices are backed up, backed by an array. And this array has a certain limit, but you don't care. Like the runtime system will be expanding uh, the size of the array for you, right? If, um, if you want to grow. So here we exhausted the limit. We said, I'm gonna have a slice of thousand and we exhausted it. So if I say C equals append another uh, item, right? I'm adding one extra item on top of already full, fully exhausted array. What's gonna happen is like, it, it will work. A, a runtime system will say, okay, the underlying array is now too small. I have to reallocate double what we had. So it will say, let's get 2000 bytes uh, copy. It will copy the thousand that I already have to the new space and it will add this new item, right? Uh, so that's what will happen if you do this extra line of code after you've done this. So there will be a lot of wasted memory allocations by, you know, by doing that, but sometimes it's unavoidable, right? Um, so it's kind of good to predict like how much space do I need and then give this hint to what you expect be enough. And then if it's not enough, it, it you know, it get, it will get doubled um, when you exhaust the limit. All right, um, functions. Yeah, that's the fun topic. I kind of like that topic. Um, so what do I say here about functions? Oh yeah, you have one last question. So let's do that. Okay, that's like a, I thought this more interesting. <laughs> All right, so for those of you who, are, who, who still have 25 seconds, write a function that returns this function. So not define a function that adds two numbers, but write a function that returns this function as a uh, output. That's more like go. Perfect. So I can see some correct solutions. It can fit into one line. Uh, this is a correct solution as well. Uh, this one is a correct solution. I don't know why Mentimeter is like so harsh on you. Good is not in Spera, right? Um, all right, so I, I will not manually change it, but it, it is correct. You basically say func. Um, so let's quickly do this here uh, and identify some elements. All right, so we say func and we say et, and then we define uh, x um, or a and b. Let's say they are ints and the return type is int and then um, uh, we say return a plus b. Um, so that's trivial. Um, there is a additional syntax which you can use, uh, which is uh, you can name the return value. So you can say uh, my return thing is called result. 
And then if you do that, then you can assign result to it, to, to it. And then when you say return, you don't need to say anything because it will, it will just return the result which has been kind of assigned, right? Uh, which one is more idiomatic? I don't know, like I kind of like the, uh, the one without the name, but sometimes it's useful to have a name, uh, especially when you are returning error and something. So for example, I'm returning error uh, E uh, and result. And then it's kind of like the E will be reused kind of in different places because you can get, you will be doing different things which can throw a different error. And then at some point it's gonna get returned, right? And then it's kind of nice just to not be keeping track and returning like the variable here. But I, I, I don't know, it, it's up to you. Like uh, I've seen code with this and I've seen code with uh, without the names, right? So if you don't name them, then you will probably have to return things like a plus b uh, and nil for the error, right? Explicitly. Okay, um, what else we see here? Um, there is a notation which is this, or you can say int a and int b, right? It is a little bit more idiomatic to do it like this, although I personally prefer this. Um, but I, I think this one is more idiomatic in Golang. All right, what else? Um, you've noticed that the types come after. Uh, in C, Java, or some other programming languages, types come before or sometimes after. It's kind of, you know, inconclusive. In Golang, they always come after. Why? Well, because it's easier to compose things, right? And I ask, can you write a function which returns this function as a, as a return thing? And you can uh, very easily do that in, in um, Golang. Uh, you would kind of um, have a lot of uh, syntactic um, difficulties doing more complex things like that in C++. It's, it's possible to do that, but it's, it gets tedious. Uh, and here we say there is a function gen which doesn't take any parameters and it returns what this function returns. It returns me a function which takes two ints as parameters and returns an int, right? So it, it kind of, it, it's quite easy to, uh, to write this. And then you just have your function and you say, return me that stuff, right? And of course you don't need add because you can use Lambda, right? So now we just wrote a function which doesn't take any arguments and returns an adder for two things, right? And, you know, why would you do that? <laughs> um, so how would you use it first? Well, then you would use it like saying f equals uh, gen. So I got the function from gen and then you could call, you know, stuff on it, right? Um, so how useful is that? It's extremely useful when you're writing middleware or when you're writing kind of a handlers for your web services, which needs to be flexible and needs to be doing some things with the incoming kind of um, requests, right? So you will be actually using that pattern quite a lot when you will be using a web framework for writing up the behaviors for some of the handlers that you're using. So this is called like a higher order function because this function returns another function. Uh, you can also have functions which take functions as arguments, and that's you know similarly easy. You, for example, you have function which modifies something. So let's say it takes f, which is a function which takes two integers and returns an integer, right? And let's make not complicated. And this function doesn't return a function. Let's this function return a value. So let's make it int, and let's make it such that it um, takes two values. So it will take um, X and Y, which are ints and a function and return an int. And what we will do is we will return F, which calls uh, X and Y and multiplies by 10, right? So we now updated our adder um, 
return. So now our modified adder is adding two numbers and multiplying it by 10, but it's doing the adding by this additional function. So if I pass it something else, it will do something else, right? Um, so it will do some arithmetic operation on two, those two numbers and then multiply the result by 10. And I can call it by, like I can just use it by saying modified adder, uh, like one and two, and then use the generated function from this guy and then give me the value, right? The gen will give me an adder and then blah, blah, blah. You understand what I'm saying, right? Uh, so you can kind of chain the functions and you can kind of uh, call, um, you know, call arguments uh, on top of the functions and the type always comes second. So it's kind of easy to read what F is. F is a function which takes two arguments and returns an int. If you rewrote this, if you if you rewrote this, um, okay, if you rewrote this line in C, you would want to kill yourself, right? Um, you can do it, you can do it in C, but it's just like uh, syntactically really ugly to look at. Uh, is it really nice to look at here? Yeah, it's not that nice neither, right? It, it is a little bit difficult, but it's much less difficult than in C. Um, and you will be using patterns like this later when you will be writing handlers and um, and things. You may be not using generators. You may be just doing Lambda functions instead, uh, but you will be kind of using patterns like this where you pass functions to other functions. Um, all right, uh, so let's move on. We have three minutes left, so not much. Let's see if we have some changes here. We do, some people gave up <laughs> uh, answering, but they still kind of strong. So C++ is better again. Uh, we have that. Structs and methods we kind of covered. Uh, I covered that with the uh, at the beginning with the pointers. Uh, functions, so Go is derived from C but it has this kind of MR functional feel. And you will be doing kind of things like that a little bit more frequent than in, you would do in C because yeah, C is doesn't really suitable for that. Uh, and it uses kind of a functional patterns. So some of those patterns I, I showed you uh, and I did this one. So write a function that takes zero arguments and returns another function which takes two parameters and returns an int, right? So now you should be able to do that. Like, uh, you know that you start from left to right, you write a function, what it takes, what it returns. If it returns a function, you say func, and you kind of use lambda syntax. If it takes a function as an argument, you say, okay, it's some sort of parameter and then func, and then it will kind of work. Um, okay, so the second one was write a method on a struct that takes a function as a parameter and applies that function to your struct. So let's very quickly do that. Like we are running a little bit out of time, but we can, it's, it's uh, pretty straightforward. So if I have, uh, let's say, let's have a struct. So I have a type, um, I don't know, student, and it's a struct and it has, um, yeah, this amazing age parameter, which is an int. And now we want to have a function which is, for example, at or oh, age by 10. So we want this function to make a student older by 10 years, right? Uh, so it will take no parameters. Like if it takes a parameter, it will be parameter s, which is our student. And because we want to update it, we cannot pass by value. So we have to pass by pointer. Um, and then what we would do is we would do, um, s h plus equals 10 right that would work but we don't want to do it as a function we want to do it as a method um, so if we want to do it as a method we would say uh, s student we wouldn't pass s here and then we would pass it as uh, as this um, but the task was write a method on a struct that takes a function as a parameter and applies that function to your struct. All right, so now 
it's a little bit different because we want to take a, like we want to have a function which does this, but this is another function. So func um, is h by 10. And now we have to come back to s student. And here we want, it's a function on a, um, it's a function on our struct, which takes a function as an argument. Um, so this function, which we will pass here, will manipulate our student. So let's call this function f, and we call it func, and it has to take it, it. It needs to take a parameter. So because this function f manipulates our struct, it has to take a student as a parameter, right? Um, I don't need to name it. Uh, so I I only say f takes a, a student as a parameter. And then I would call F on my S, right? So that's the task uh, solved. I have a, a method, um, let's call it call, and it takes a function and it applies this function on, on my student. And I have a function like that here. And then I would use it like if I uh, have a student S, which is a student. Um, then I would call it s dot call, and I would pass age by uh, by ten here, right? Who doesn't get it at all? Who is comfortable with it and would be able to use it? All right, so somewhere in between. <laughs> All right, um, so play with functions. Try to write simple functions like adding, multiplying, and try to play with passing functions around. That will get your intuitions of how this those patterns are done. You will it will be helpful later when you're doing more advanced things with handlers. Okay, so that's it for today. Thanks.